I don't think that people have malintent. I don't think that fitness influencers are being malicious or manipulative. I just think sometimes there's just bad advice. Maybe advice that's dated, it isn't up to date with newer research, because it's easy to happen. Like you can go on PubMed and find research, and the next thing you know, oh shoot, that was from 2001. We're giving advice on this 22 years later, right? So although a lot of fitness influencers are, I don't know, maybe a little cavalier and might be a little negligent at times, I don't think they're doing things badly. But I wanna go through what I would consider to be the 14 worst pieces of fitness advice that I see floating around. And I'll just jump right in. I mean, I'll say first off, I'm not perfect. I've made my fair share of mistakes, but I wanna address the things that I've seen. So number one is you see people telling you to eat when you're hungry. And I respect this and I appreciate it because it's about just listening to your body and intuitively eating. So again, I don't think it's malintent, but the problem that we face with that is nowhere in our menu of items to choose from as far as food is concerned, are we really eating natural food that would be triggering our hunger cues and our satiety cues properly? We have distorted cues from hyperpalatable food that make us hungry all the time. If I were to listen to my cues, I would probably be eating too much. If most people were listening to their nutritional intake cues, they would end up overeating tremendously because our brains are lit up like Christmas trees from hyperpalatable fats and hyperpalatable carbohydrates mixed into a beautiful trans fatty acid cocktail of garbage that tricks our brain into wanting more. So if you eat when you're hungry, you're not really eating when you're hungry. You're eating when you think you're hungry. The next piece of advice isn't necessarily the worst piece of advice, it's just incomplete. There are a handful of people out there that will still say you should never work out without fuel, that you need fuel to work out, like we're a freaking car. Our bodies have the ability to utilize our own stored substrates, and that's one of the beauties of us, is we have the ability to be advanced and tap into our storage systems. We're not a car. I'm sorry, I can use analogies all day long, like a car, like an internal combustion engine, but reality is, is we can train in a fasted state. We can be depleted. We can be nutrient deprived. As a matter of fact, there might even be some benefit to it but it's definitely not a requirement to have fuel to train. And no, you won't waste away unless you're taking it to an extreme. There's only a small handful of people out there now that still give this advice, and that's that you need to eat right after your workout to stop the muscle breakdown. The literature is quite strong now, suggesting that muscle protein synthesis is elevated for 24 to 48 hours after a workout. You don't need to eat right after your workout. There's a marginal increase in protein synthesis that occurs directly after a workout. It's not even worth stressing about. The most important part is get adequate protein during your recovery window, which is the next 24 hours. That's what matters. So is it terrible advice to tell someone to eat right after their workout? I don't think it's setting people back, but it might be standing in the way of them getting adequate nutrition and adequate micronutrients throughout the rest of the day. Maybe they're electing to have a protein shake post-workout and then not really having a nutritious lunch, when in reality, just skip the post-workout and eat a more nutritious lunch or something like that. This next one is really bad advice, and it does actually scare me that people believe this. And this has come up to, against me directly, and it's that walking is not good for fat loss because it doesn't burn enough calories. We cannot just look at thermodynamics here. We need to look at a number of things. We need to look at the satiety aspect of walking, the psychological aspect of walking, the fact that walking is passive. You don't even realize you're exercising when you're walking. So yes, I absolutely agree. If I went out and I ran six miles right now, I would burn more calories in 40 minutes than I would if I was walking for 40 minutes. But I can't make a phone call, I can't close a deal, I can't do something while I'm running most of the time, but I certainly can while I'm walking, so I didn't think about it. So to say that walking is not an adequate form of cardio because it doesn't burn enough calories is very naive. Number five is one that is very, very, very important these days. In the world of just conflating weird information that's out there, 
To say that you should not spike your insulin or never raise your insulin levels is absolutely scary. You would literally be having to live on like butter, realistically like oil to never spike your insulin. Carbs are not the only thing that spike your insulin. Protein spikes your insulin. So fitness influencers out there that scare people away from an insulin spike, like it's this horrible thing that is the root of obesity, are doing a disservice. Insulin is required for recovery. It's the most important, if you ask me, peptide hormone that's in the body. And if you eat a steak right now, you're gonna have a pretty massive insulin spike from it because you need insulin to get protein into the tissue as well. It doesn't just happen with carbohydrates. Granted, they're slightly different in terms of the glucagon counter-regulatory stuff, but don't be afraid of insulin. It's terrible advice. It'll scare you away from ever getting the recovery that you need to be the person you want to be. Number six, people that tell you not to lose weight too fast. I know that I'll catch flack for this one because on the surface, it seems like you're endorsing an extreme form of dieting. I'm not suggesting that people go out there and fast for two weeks to try to lose all their weight. Heck, I'm not even gonna suggest that you should fast at all if you don't want to. But what I am gonna say is that the literature suggests that there's no difference between losing weight fast and losing weight slow as far as who is going to keep the weight off. As a matter of fact, I could probably make a strong argument that losing weight fast could even be better because then you're getting yourself out of the danger zone. If your body fat levels are so high that you're sitting in an inflammatory danger zone with all kinds of risk factors, if you can get your weight down fast and arguably stay there just as well as if you got it down slow, wouldn't you wanna spend less time in that danger zone and just get there fast? If you can maintain and you can do it without reducing your metabolic rate too much, what's the big deal? As a matter of fact, an acute drop in your calories might even be a little bit better than a chronic slow drop in your calories. But again, it's not about whether you're losing weight fast or slow, it's about telling someone to not lose weight fast because it's bad for them. That's like me telling you it's not good to lose weight slow because it'd be bad for you. See what I'm saying? Number seven is put on muscle before you lose fat. Oh, I'm already a little soft. Might as well just try to bulk right now. Having extra fat on you does you no service whatsoever when it comes to building muscle. As a matter of fact, the literature suggests it's more of a detriment. You have more aromatase activity. You have a higher potential to convert into estrogen. You have higher inflammatory cytokines. They're inhibiting anabolic signaling. It's not good to have extra fat on you ever. Maybe unless you're freezing and you're up in the Arctic, I don't know. Even then, it could probably make an argument against it. So when it comes down to bulking, you can lose fat and build muscle at the same time. As long as protein needs are met, you're fine. So you can bulk and cut at the same time. Two different systems. They don't require, they operate not in tandem, but somewhat independently. Number eight, protein powder is not a food. Now this is a weird one. It's not, it is a supplement and it shouldn't replace food. But there's a handful of people out there that think that protein powder is purely like synthetic garbage. Like a good protein powder, like whey protein is just filtered milk. Like literally, it has other stuff added to it if you look for it, but if you just get pure protein powder that's unadulterated, like unflavored stuff, it's filtered milk. That's literally what it is. It's a concentrated filtered milk that's concentrating the protein. I consider that a decent food, although it doesn't replace whole food from the earth and it is processed to a degree. I think in the world of fitness to like steer people away from that because of fear is the wrong way. If people wanna stay away from protein powder because they wanna eat close to the earth as possible without supplements, more power to them. Like I'll take chicken breast, turkey breast, steak any day over a protein shake, but to rain on the protein shake parade because it's artificial doesn't make a ton of sense unless it has a bunch of artificial things added to it. I consume whey protein powder and I consume plant-based protein powder depending on when I need them. Do I live on them? No. I certainly supplement with them because they're a macronutrient. It's not a random synthetic supplement unless it has stuff added to it. One of the ones that I use, I put a link down below since people ask all the time, it's called the Active Protein Line from Sun Warrior. 
This particular one is a plant-based one, but it has pea protein and it has pumpkin seed protein, which is a really interesting combination. Pumpkin seed protein is one of the highest quality plant-based proteins that you can get. But they make it like a whole food. So they have vitamins in it, they have enzymes in it to help digest, they have uh, bacterial components, so they have like microbes, they have sort of a probiotic effect in there. But they also just make it a full spectrum with antioxidants and all this stuff too. So it's a really good quality product that doesn't have a bunch of additives. It has guar gum in it, which is actually a positive additive. It's actually soluble fiber if you want to really get down to it. So anyhow, that link is down below that saves you 20% off whatever you want from Sun Warrior, whether you want to try their hydration, whether you want to try any of their stuff, but I do recommend their active protein. So that link is down below, no pressure at all. People just ask the one that I use. I use whey protein and I use the Sun Warrior active line and the taste is second to none. So again, link down below for 20% off. Number nine is never mix cardio and weights together like CrossFit. It's called the interference effect. Fitness influencers will tell you that that interference effect is gonna take away from your maximal loads on its things. Well, if you're training too hard with cardio at the same time, you won't be able to train maximally with weights. And if you're training too hard with weights, you're not gonna be able to give all your attention to cardio. I mean, that's true if you're trying to get to like 100% at each, but aren't we looking for overall fitness? As a matter of fact, there's some literature that debunks the interference theory altogether. In 2022, there was a study published in Sports Medicine that took a look at 43 studies ultimately finding that concurrent training had zero negative impact whatsoever. There was not any negative impact. Like you could train concurrently at the same time doing a salt bike and then jumping into deadlifts and there was no detriment as far as body composition or muscle protein synthesis. As a matter of fact, there's literature to suggest when you look mechanistically that doing concurrent training and adding the cardio into the mix actually changes, alters protein metabolism to where you might get more of a benefit by doing it. Number 10 is one that I'm surprised is still floating around. And that is sipping on branched chain amino acids to reduce muscle breakdown. The literature is not strong here. And first of all, most of us have switched over to EAAs by now. BCAAs are garbage. So we've kind of switched to EAAs. And the real literature that's strong on EAAs, essential amino acids, or leucine in general, is in conjunction with protein. So you're, to get the best effect out of an EAA, it's actually taking it with protein that you're ingesting to begin with. So if like you sit down and you eat a chicken breast, having a scoop of EAAs might increase the protein synthesis with that meal or increase the protein availability. But having BCAAs during your morning cardio, it's not gonna really spare muscle. At least the literature doesn't really make it clear. Number 11 is one that people are starting to figure out, but we're still hearing a lot of garbage on it. Ice plunge or a cold plunge for recovery. Now let me really explain something that's important here. I think cold plunges are great. I own one. I own two. I really like them. I think they feel great. I think that's a great alternative to coffee in the morning. I sleep good from it. I mentally feel like it's doing something. But what I can tell you is that the literature really stacks against it as far as recovery is concerned. Going in a cold plunge after a workout is not gonna help you recover. If anything, it could actually blunt the inflammatory response that makes you recover, but that's neither here nor there. Ice plunge is stressful. It's not recovery. It should be in place of a workout for something different or used as a stimulus for a short amount of time. It's not relaxing. It's not meant to be relaxing. It's not meant to help you recover. It might help your brain recover, but if anything, it might actually slow you down. So just because it's hard, and just because it seems cool and all the cool kids are doing it on the gram, doesn't mean that you should really do it if ultimate recovery is your goal. Number 12 is one that's interesting. And that is the line of everything in moderation. I hear it all the time. If I do a video on alcohol, people will say, oh yeah, but come on, live a little. Everything in moderation. On one hand, I agree. But on the other hand, I also think everything in moderation, including moderation. So when you start telling yourself that everything is okay in moderation, you open up this gateway into all kinds of other things. Oh, it's a little bit of alcohol, it's fine. Oh, it's a little bit of uh, you know, junk food, it's fine. If you're going to do it, that's fine. But when you tell yourself that everything in moderation is kind of your mantra, you really lose sort of the obsessive edge that actually you might need to get to where you're going. So in the world of fitness advice, I don't think everything in moderation is okay. I think that in the world of fitness advice, you should live freely 
and you should enjoy things that make you happy, but you should not exactly give yourself a license to do things that you know are bad. That doesn't make a whole lot of sense when you know something is bad, but you cave to it anyway. And I guess the message here is to be strong in that. So don't give yourself that license. Number 13, and this is funny because I'm not a kinesiology major. I'm not, I don't know all of this stuff really well, but I do know one thing. If you only do compound movements, like multi-joint movements, like bench press, deadlift, squat, shoulder press, push press, whatever, you're going to get results and you're going to definitely move the biggest parts of your body. And if you had to just do that for the life of you, that's fine. Like you could do that forever. But when we start suggesting that people don't need to do functional work and that the people that are positioning functional work as important are zealots or are crazy or are crazy influencers, I understand it's one thing to do extreme weird exercises where you're like balancing something on your head while dangling something else while whatever. Sure, but don't rain on functional movements because the bottom line is we are very linear people in how most of us train. And that's not exactly good. So are physiques built with compound movements? Yes. But if you wanna walk like a robot for the rest of your life, you can keep doing that. So when you listen to influencers that say, ah, oh, like isolation movements aren't gonna get you anywhere. This isn't gonna get you anywhere. Functional movement, ah, oh, screw that. Like we don't want that. We want compound movements. It's all a balance with that. I guess that's where I could say everything in moderation, right? It's where it comes down to doing the right amount to feel good and not just listening to someone on Instagram. And the very last one that I want to address, some of the worst advice I've probably heard recently, is that fat burns fat. Eating fat burns fat. No, no. Eating fat might provide your body with great nutritional value that you need. Eating fat might give you valuable, valuable tools that your body needs to build hormones, to function, to fuel itself. But no, eating fat is not gonna magically make you burn fat. Eating fat might help your body utilize fats better in a calorie deprived, lower carb ketogenic state, but it's not gonna make you burn fat. As a matter of fact, restricting fats usually makes you burn fat more. Doesn't mean that fats are bad, but if you go and you shovel a bunch of oil down your throat, you're not gonna magically burn fat as a result. It's not how it works. Anyhow, I'll see you tomorrow.